Welcome to the Inner Athlete Podcast, where we discuss all things youth athlete development and youth mentoring. Let's get started. Sure, sure. So, Stefan, welcome to the podcast. Our second guest here. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. Uh, Dave, Dave, you're back as well. <laughs> Hello. Hello. It's good to see you guys. It's yeah, all, it's, it's great to see to you too. Good. Yeah, it's really great to have you around, um, but we want to get straight into this one. Um, to give you a little bit of a background on Stefan and what he's done, study, and I guess work and whatnot so he's got a, a master's in psychotherapy and counseling uh he specifically has worked with youth uh, in relationships and at the moment you're in disability is that right that's correct yeah so i work uh currently as positive behavior support practitioner essentially the job is finding out uh, about you know behaviors whether they're you know violent or anxiety or maybe just kind of getting in someone's personal way and then finding out how to work with that, create a plan and find out what the reason behind it. Because a lot of clients that I work with can't exactly tell us what's going on. So it's about really understanding. Cool. Uh, it sounds really interesting. Um, definitely an interesting area, um, especially because we work with um, individuals that may have some sort of um, disability yeah. as well. But the reason why that we've got you here today is we want to talk all about motivation. Now, mot- motivation tends to be a real buzzword. It's been buzzword for years and years. Mm. Um, give us your, give us like the kind of the, the brief breakdown on what I guess motivation is in terms of like I guess the uh, the the world that we have in terms of like social media. Then we talk about like what is motivation more in the academic side. Okay, so motivation is essentially one's ability to kind of be motivated to to do something. You know, you got many different types. I mean you've got your basic needs you know i mean we're all motivated to eat we're all motivated to try get sleep and drink and all that kind of stuff and as we kind of take care of our base needs you know motivation gets a bit more complex so for instance um oh let's let's use exercise as an example motivation for exercise is different for each individual and what i mean by that is uh each individual has their own thing that they're trying to achieve um you know you got yourself dave powerlifting you know, Trent, you're looking for more kind of an overall performance, but still strength-based. Yeah, I say so, yeah. Yeah, and where my motivation is to essentially find out what I can do, really. You know, as I'm getting older, I want to make sure that I've, you know, find out what I physically can do before it's too late, you know. And so when we look at those things, all our motivations are essentially the same in the idea of fitness, but how we speak to those motivations and what works for us is very different. And then that's, I think, one of the, the illusions that motivation is given. Everyone kind of feels like one piece will fit everyone. You know, one idea will fit all. But it's really not the case. Everyone is an individual and it's about finding what individually motivates someone and what someone needs. Yeah, it's like finding that tick. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, especially when it comes to youth because, I mean, you know, as an adult, I'm still figuring myself out. I'm still finding out what works for me. I still hit hurdles all the time. But as a kid, you don't really understand who you are yet. And there's that idea that, oh, they're kids. They just bounce and they go. They bounce and they go. But there's never that whole thing of there's so many more complexities going on for motivation. Yeah. Can you kind of give us a bit of an example of like what what are those potential complexities that you might have with someone that might be low in motivation that you've worked with in the past? So let's uh, go with the idea of someone who wants to start exercising it's overwhelming you don't know how to do anything and everyone around you who you normally talk to about it is someone who's been exercising for a while so you're motivated to want to exercise but it is a daunting task the idea is how can i do this and then that clashes with the motivation of i want to do this so you've got one side ah, i really want to do this the other side is is this possible And some days you're going to feel really low energy in the tank. It's going to be hard to get out of bed. And then you're going to be like, well, can I do this? And that's when we hit that wall. You know, you might have got an injury, set yourself back. You might be fatigued, you know, or you might be lifting the same weight over and over and over again for like a month without progress. And we all know that it's the situation is that you are still progressing. It just might not be visible. So when it comes to the, those ideas of motivation, you've got someone starting off, they, it's easy to get lost in all that. And so you've got to get back to the grassroots. Well, why are you training? What, what is the reasons that you're coming back? Is it health? Is it performance? 
uh, or you're trying to prove something, you're trying to get better at something, and then really tapping into those things, but also showing the possibilities. Mm. Yeah, because like some members here, you know, that might have been training somewhere, haven't had a structure or something like that for a while, haven't made any progress. And then sometimes when you sit down with them and you go really deep into it, you know, I've had, you know, one of the members here, you know, eventually she wants to have her first child. And mm. that's a reason why to actually get into the gym, be healthy. Um, and just when she does decide to pull the trigger on that, that she's going to be healthy, be physically um, capable in order to carry the child and even uh, post-pregnancy as well and actually be able to rebound quicker and feel healthy as well. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing, it's, it, that's her motivation. Mm. But if you would essentially say, oh, here's the three tenets of motivation or here's the five beliefs of motivation or, you know, here's the special warm-up program for motivation, that's, it's, it's all dressing. The people who often tell you how motivation works are people who are business people, you know, people who write books and stuff like that. And they might have some basic understanding of psychology, you know, maybe some basic information. But I mean, at the end of the day, they're writing a book because they know they're going to make money to write that book that people are going to grab onto it. Yeah, it's kind of like, I think you've, you've, we've had discussions about this before about mm. like, you know, self-help, you know, um, it's kind of like self-help is good only to those who are willing to accept that. Look, and that's with anything. If you're looking for something to believe in and someone comes up to you and be like, hey, here's something to believe in, you'll believe in it. If you're looking for a new diet and then suddenly, you know, a diet pops up on Facebook, you're more likely to click on that and follow it. You know, if you're looking for friendship and someone says hi, you're going to be more open to having an experience with that person. Mm -hmm. It's just with anything, really. Uh, and that's how it kind of works with self-help. I want to change myself. I want to fix myself. Here's a book for you. I read it. Wow, I'm open to it. Well, of course I'm open to it because I'm looking for that. You know, I'm looking for something to believe in. And this book is something to believe in. And because I believe in it, it works. Uh, you look at anything. Um, if people believe that something works... You know, they'll follow through with it, even if it, it, you know, the placebo effect that we're looking at here. I mean, there's many, many, many examples of the placebo effect. Uh, one of the most interesting ones probably related to this field was um, knee reconstruction. Uh, so people with knee injuries, they did an experiment where they gave half the people operations and showed the other half videos of, of fake, operations. Yeah, fake yeah. operations. And what they actually found is the group that didn't have the operation reported having longer life recovery and felt great and were able to do a lot more Just with better it. health outcomes better health outcomes because they were doing the maintenance exercises after the rehab they were doing the bits and pieces because they thought i had an operation i have to follow through with this so on the flip side of that then those who actually got the reconstruction they're like oh did they kind of think that they were like somewhat fixed and they just had to do a couple of weeks of rehab and were back into it? So the people who actually had the operation, because both of them thought they had the operation, the group that did have the operation, the pain eased off for only a short time and then they had chronic pain come back like a few months later. Wow. So this is an older study, but, um, but yeah, and arguably you could say the group that uh, didn't have the injury just did the uh, exercises and took it seriously, but there's a lot of factors in that because they're motivated to start working on that knee. I mean, after you get an op, it's very encouraged to do all these things. You take the time, you take the time off, you do all this other kind of stuff that you might not be able to do when you're not post-op. Yeah. So, yeah. That's wild. Let's go to you. What, what gets you motivated? Oh, well, so the first time I really, really got motivated uh, as an adult was I gained a bunch of weight. Uh, I saw the doctor. The doctor said to me very simply, Either lose weight or lose your liver. Shit. <laughs> so that motivated me like crazy. I uh, got into a diet. I stuck to it. I lost weight. Um, and so I was about 115 uh, kilos at my heaviest. And by the end of everything I was following, I was towards 71 kilos. Wow. And that happened over a, probably a year. Um, and I, it's, it's a year. It's 46 kilos. That's a lot of weight in yeah, a short period of time. A lot of weight. Crazy. Yeah, and, and I was very motivated. I was, I was on the keto diet at the time, um, you know, and that, that worked for me. Uh, it doesn't work for everyone. Uh, my partner, uh, she tried the, the diet as well, but it kind of inflared her joints and she wasn't too good on it. So she went on a different diet, worked for her. Um, but I found losing that weight, the side effect of that was I slept better. Um, I stopped snoring. 
and overall I felt great. And so that motivated me to keep the weight off because I felt fantastic. Of course, eventually I got quite ill later on. This is much later after the diet and whatnot. Mm. Um, I got quite ill and then I ended up putting the weight on again and I felt lost and I felt like in a dark place. And there was no doctor saying, lose weight or lose an organ. So my motivation changed and what that motivation became, and I, and I did see that, that crossroads in front of me of, do I push this? Do I try and lose this weight? Do I try and regain that great feeling? Or do I just slump into this and it was very close and that's the other thing with motivation that the lack of motivation is very easy but it's also very heavy where having motivation is very uplifting and very energetic but it's a constant war that that's the thing it is a constant war it's not about wake up and you do this and you do that it's more about the situation of taking a breath being kind to yourself and saying you know what, I want to do this, I want to achieve this. So in this case, I wanted to lose the weight and I wanted to get fit again and I wanted to get strong again and I wanted to get back that good feeling. But also, again, like I said at the start of this, I train because I want to find out what I can do before it's too late. So going back to the point, it's, every day I struggle with that whole situation of it'd be nice to stay home, it'd be nice to sleep in, oh, I'd love to have like an extra slice of something or an extra piece of something because it takes great. But then it's just talking to myself and not beating myself up for screwing up, mm. but appreciating myself, like almost giving myself a hug and talking it through it because then you get rid of the boogeyman. And that's the thing because you, you hate yourself, you yell at yourself sometimes, you really get pissed off at yourself for doing the smallest thing. But at the end of the day, if instead of getting angry at yourself, you try and put a name to that monster, you will be able to succeed and do more and do better. Mm. Like, you know, I guess throwing that question back to you, you know, like I said, I came back because I wanted to, you know, get that back again. And I'm still working on stuff. And there's some mornings where I just look at the clock and I'm like, damn. But I'll get into tricks for how to deal with that stuff later. Um be it yourself. Surely you don't just wake up magically every day and be like, woo! Um, there's, some days are better than others, that's for sure. Mm. Um, but the reason why I do get up early, you know, I do get up most mornings at, at like you know, 5 o'clock or 5 to 5. To five. Um, Saturday mornings I do sleep and it's till 6 a.m. Oh, rebel. Um, but um, I think... Because I understand my motivational factor is because I understand like my greater purpose, and I have I had this um I, I don't I don't think I've really just disclosed this to many people, but my my thinking is like I want to be able to make such an impact in my community or just in my local area that that it would be a no brainer for the government to put on a state funeral for me. That's amazing. But, yeah, so that's kind of like part of the reason why I do wake up and do what I do and make the impact and have the discussions with. You know, with you guys, all the members here, all the parents that we, you know, all the youth athletes and their parents that we support, but in being able to expand our network in that regards to continue to support, you know, more people because, like, the reason why I created this place in the first place was because I wish I had something like this Yeah. when I was younger. Pretty simple. Having older mentors, you know, who are, you know, five, ten years older, who've kind of walked through life, you know, that aren't too far removed from, you know, knowing things of what's relevant. And I, f I find that some parents, you know, it could be two or three generations between, you know, teenagers and parents these days. And it's kind of like it creates a major disconnect and we help to create that a bit more of a, um, uh, that mentoring environment for the kids here. Mm -hmm. But that's really my main driver is because I wish I had something like this when I was younger and be able to establish that as a great thing then move on to the next stage of having a state funeral which yeah which would be cool like I, I, it can partly sound ego driven but I mean at the core of that is this very beautiful thing you want to support people in a way that you wish you were supported and you want to have such an impact in in the world that everyone kind of feels like so appreciative that they got that help like I know I wish I had something like this when I was a kid I was very overweight very unfit um, and, you know, I'm still uh, working on body mechanics that are so messed up um, about getting them right. I mean, were you, were you fit as a kid? Did you... Um, was I fit as a kid? I was sporty as a kid. I was a heavy kid. I was super heavy. I was, like, I was like, when you say heavy, are we talking about overweight or are we talking, no, I was talking about muscular? I was talking like, like 11, 12 years old, 100 kilos. Oof. I was a hefty boy. 
Yeah, I think Dave's. <laughs> Dave yeah, was I, so I remember being at a podiatrist, and this was probably like in year six, so probably at twelve years old, and I was getting orthotics, and so the podiatrist asked me to step on the scales, and I'm thinking, oh no, here we go, and I uh, stepped on, and um, yeah, nine nine kilos, and uh, I was I was a bit shocked. Mum was a bit like, ugh, and um, so. I think that, yeah, it's a big memory of mine is like being 12 years old and year six, 100 kilos, not the best feeling. No. And throwing it to you, Dave, like same question, you know, like your motivation, what, what gets you going? Because again, I don't think that you're just going to be casually, I'm up, yep, everything's 100% always. Um, yeah, it's, I was thinking about this before. Um, it's, I wake up because it's bigger than myself. Um, I have the opportunity to leave a domino effect on so many different people. Hmm. So working in an athlete, the outstanding business scene and all that stuff. But it's, <laughs> yeah. it, is, it, is, it is a reason. I wake up at 5, 5 a.m. and I'm like, I'll just I'll sleep in until 10 a.m. But the people who come in, they're driving to see us and we're there to support them. And I want to see them with a smile on their face, with a laugh, let them be heard and seen. Um, that's be the bigger reason. Like it's more than just a sets and reps. It's, yeah. yeah, but but um, g- going to the more of the personal life thing because you are a, like you know a competitive athlete. Yeah. What? H- how, how do you maintain being a competitive athlete? What what gets you going? What makes you push yourself? You know, breaking that freaking wall or ceiling as you would call it. Yeah, I guess uh, growing up, like I never really had a, a large self of sense of self esteem. Mm. So I think weightlifting allows me to get a bit of. Um, a good sense of sense of self-esteem and um i don't try and become na- narcissistic and say oh i'm i'm i'm, I'm muscly i'm all that stuff because more than just that but again it allows me to um work on something for myself yeah. yeah and i guess at the end of the day this conversation is essentially between like three fat kids really yeah. you know it's that idea that we all have gone through different journeys you know, we all have different motivators, you know. Mine is very self-informed to see what I can do, you know. You know, Trent, yours is very idealistic for kind of what you want to bring into the world. Where, you know, Dave, you've got this this pride, you know, and self-representation, you know. But also this humbleness, you know. You, you're you looking at competing in this extreme way where a lot of people would, their motivation would be maybe flexing on others. Where yours is very humble, which is, you know, pretty good to see. But it could be because you started from the mud you know mm. like the it was a slog to get where you were yeah i've been to a stage of like having the ego to be like oh i'm stronger than you i'm better than you and i realized it wasn't serving me or anyone else so i use it more as a an example to show what people can become and that's why i don't i don't, I don't like to brag about it but at the end of the day it's just a number i think the person who i've become because of it is more important than just the what you see yeah yeah and, and that's the thing i mean at the end of the day you got motivation like when it comes down to it, going back to the original, the idea of motivation is that you'll have some people who train specifically for vanity. God knows that uh, once I hit a few picks, I want to get a bit of vanity in there. I mean, who doesn't want to see their own abs or, you know, be able to do some kind of the fancy stuff you see people on YouTube do? But at the end of that, and that's motivation. There's nothing wrong with being motivated to look better, to feel better, um, to move better. Like, I mean, there's a lot of people whose motivation isn't to to do with a specific sport or to lift a specific weight it's just to look good and to feel good Mm. and usually something can stem from that as well Mm. so going back to a i know a key thing is is youth right if we look at youth and motivation it's it's quite different from adults in the sense that there are a lot of factors to youth um when we talked about the needs before we've got the idea of friendship friends groups and friendship is a very big one for youth uh, you know when you become an adult you're a bit more self-aware who you are you might not need as much in the way of group think it's still good to have friends groups even if you feel like a hermit it's still good to get out there socialize a bit it's good for your mental health but when we talk about kids friendships is a big thing so team sports is always good to have but it's also good to have individualistic sports in the sense like martial arts. I, I always push martial arts hardcore. I always love it. My, mm-hmm. my background athletically is martial arts. Um, and the reason I push it is because it's a sense of self, a sense of understanding. And it can be a team or solo situation. So you're working for yourself and, you, you know, you're really encouraged to think things through. Um, not saying that's not the case for other sports, but it's a very, you know, centered kind of a thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a new, uh, unique environment, martial arts. It's yeah. very unique. Compared to like team sports, yeah, you all work together as a 
common goal. Mm-hmm. But then if you look at team sports and more the elite level, you're still competing against each other to get a starting spot. Oh, absolutely. But then there's that, like, not toxicity isn't the right word, is that whole situation of you want to be friends with these people, but at the end of the day, they're your competitors. And that can foster a bit of a, a bit of a rub. Yeah, it, it can be healthy to a point. And I think it's like, you know, the, the, do- uh, the poisons and the dosage of how much of that. Yeah. And look, when we look at youth, there's many different factors. I mean, you've got a kid who's sporty and you've got a kid who's not sporty. I mean, when you get kids, that, you know, it's probably... Most of them who come here are probably sporty, I'm going to guess. Yeah, I'll say, yeah, at least 60% uh, have a sporting background, whether it's club level, state level, or national level. Yeah, and then there's some very impressive athletes, that's for sure. Um, but it's that situation is those ones, they already started that process. They've already started running down that path. They have that momentum, right? But when they hit walls, that's the difficult thing to address, mm. where the other half, or the other, let's say, 30%, is kids who are already in the mud. And you've got to get those wheels turning. And when you say to them, you know, let's say a box jump, you know, you're going to be able to jump, you know, hip height. You know, they're like, wait, what? No, no I can't do that. That's, that's impossible, you know. And then you see, you know, someone Dave's size jump even higher than that. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's very impressive to see someone move because you don't believe in these things. You don't think they're possible. You're questioning someone's ground beliefs. But when, you, when they have someone, like you said, the reason you're running this program, it can help motivate them. But then it's finding out why they're here. Are they here to lose weight? Are they here for confidence? And finding out how to help someone. It's just really breaking it down. Each person is an individual. They're going to have their values. They're going to have their beliefs. And challenging values and beliefs is very hard. You know, and the older you get, the harder it is to challenge. Mm. Then when we look at the athletes who are already motivated, when they hit a wall, it could be start with an athlete who's 12. They're doing a really good job. Puberty comes a knocking. Mm. Suddenly everything's shaken. You know, they, they want to socialize. They want to see friends. And then when you break it down, it's like, oh, you're training six days a week. You're attending school five days a week. You're trying to catch up with friends. No wonder you're exhausted. No wonder you're tired. No wonder your performance is going down. I mean, that's a lot of training. You know, you can't really say, oh, no, no, take a day off school. <laughs> you know, school's important. But at the same time, sometimes the homework that these kids get bogged down with is just, just a bit too much. You know, if they want to go to university and all this other kind of stuff, yeah, fair enough. Um, It's good for them to get used to the workload kind of gradually. But again, if they're training so much and going to school all the time, and then of course they're going to do their own kind of training stuff, maybe around the house running around or their own warm-up techniques or whatever. I mean, these kids are athletes. But at the same time, something has to give to be able to do those things. And when we're looking at development, something that gives could be detrimental to their progress. Yeah, back to the old saying, you know, the poisons in the dosage too much of any one thing can be detrimental to the development so say for example the amount of homework like some of the stories we hear about homework and you know the amount of work that needs to be done is, is ridiculous it's probably more than most universities would actually offer as well the workload is ridiculous and they're tired they're burnt out they have to stay up later than normal to get it completed because there's a timeline they get, otherwise they get detention you know it's just a perpetual cycle that they're stuck in yeah yeah look very, very much so so then we go to the, the point that I said before, ways to kind of help break things down. So you want to get rid of thinking as much as possible when it comes to, let's say, exercise and performance. You want to get rid of thinking as much as possible. One of the benefits of a place like this is they've got a tablet, they're already set up. But getting here, that's where the rub is. You'll find if an athlete makes it here and their goals are very, very in front of them, They'll do it. They'll do the work. They'll get through it. They'll achieve what they need to achieve and then they'll go home. Or they might stick around for a quick chat before they leave. Yep. Now it's them getting here. The best ways is to cut out thinking. So one thing that stops professional athletes from staying professional athletes once they start, let's say, working part-time or if they start studying or let's say, you know, there's something else happening in their life is the idea that they're fatigued. Now, we have our mental energy and we have our physical energy, all right? If you, read, if you spend all day reading a book, you're going to be mentally fatigued. You're going to be tired. The idea of going for a walk or a run, you're like, no, 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 I've just, I'm tired, I'm tired. Now, there is actually a crossover. If you start that walk, about 10 minutes into that walk, suddenly you're going to feel revived, like you've just woken up from a sleep because mm. your brain's switching over the energy it's using and then you're able to do those things. So, with kids at school, you want, 
them to be in the place they can be to get to that training. So what I do is I always make sure I have all my gym clothes ready to go. Or when I get home um, from work, first thing I do is I get changed into my gym clothes. Can't argue when you're already changed. One of the biggest rubs I know when it comes to exercise and all that kind of stuff is, oh, I need to pack my bag or I need to get changed. I need to get organized. But if you're already organized, you know, and your shoes are ready at the front door, you have to do is put your shoes on. There's less point for argument, mm. right? You're already in the car. Oh, I'm already in the car. I'm already heading there. Well, you can't turn around. You're already in the car. You're already getting there. And then once you walk through the front door, oh, I'm here. I might as well start my warm up. And then bam, once you've started your warm up, the crossover happens. I'm awake now. Let's do some exercise. Let's dance. But then let's say you feel depressed beforehand. Depression makes thinking harder. And that's why we cut out the thinking. We get you ready beforehand. Motivation's low. Yeah, the motivation is low, but you're not thinking. You're, you're just floating through life. And then you'll get to that point where you're at training. And then the motivation will spike up. And you will find that you will be able to do more. Look, it's not guaranteed. It's not a silver bullet. You know, we're not dealing with werewolves here. You know, there's no guarantee of taking it out. Sometimes you are going to have those days where it's really hard. And it's important to reach out and talk to people. It's important, you know, to be open to conversations. It's important to, you know, say, hey, you know, I'm having a bit of a hard day, you know. And I mean, you can talk to your coaches, you know. You guys are very open to conversation. I mean, you guys have had your own experiences, you know. Kids might not necessarily talk to their parents, mm -hmm. you know. Because parents are great. They're, you know, they're lovely and all this other kind of stuff. But the idea of a parent understanding what you're going through, as a, you know, when you're a kid is, is an alien idea truth is parents understand exactly what you're going through because they were there you know it might be a bit different when it comes to you know social media what you're learning at school all that other kind of stuff but the general stuff you know the awkwardness of puberty how do i talk to the person i like mm. you know growing pains but it's just all about cutting out thought if you're in the right place you will do the right thing most of the time you know I mean, if you have the dish in your hand when you walk to the sink, you're not just going to drop it on the floor. You're going to take it all the way to the sink and put it in the sink. And then the chances of you washing it afterwards because you're already at the sink is a bit higher. But if that plate stays at the table, mm. you know, you're not going to wash it. It's not going to make it to the sink. It's just going to be a mess. Yeah, so you're really just reducing the mental strain. 100%. Decision fatigue. Mm. And so they did studies to do with the difference between uh, highly successful people and average people. And so what they found is highly successful people uh, operate a bit differently. So the initial theory for the study was that highly su successful people maybe had something different about them because they were able to achieve way more in a day than your average Joe. Mm. But what they actually found, and here's the secret, is the successful people, they burnt the exact same amount of mental energy and physical energy, all that was the exact same. They struggled with the same stuff, but they cut out the little stuff. You know, it's easy to say when, you know, you're, you're wealthy. I mean, you look at uh, a celebrity. I mean, they have someone to cook for them. They have someone to clean for them. They have someone to drive for them, get them changed, get them ready. And because of that, I mean, that cuts out a lot of work. But you start with the basics. I mean, if you know what you're going to have for dinner, you have it prepared, you know, and you just have to cook it. Like, I mean, meal prep. Yeah, just heat it up. I mean, you have your, you got your meal prep, that cuts stuff out. You got your gym clothes, that cuts stuff out. You book in your gym times in advance ahead of schedule, that cuts things out. Anything you can do to kind of reduce that. Because if you know what's going on, you don't have to think about things. You don't have to plan about things, you know. And it's not always going to work, definitely not. I mean, a road could be closed or your knee might play up, you might feel a bit sick or maybe you're really fatigued. And in those cases, you just kind of got to listen to yourself. If the road's closed, all right, push through if you can, all right? But if you're really fatigued, you know what? Rest can help you progress. And so motivation is a beast that of many faces, many names, and it's really about finding out what motivates the individual. What, find out what motivates you, why it's important to you, and make sure everyone knows what motivates you because no one can help you and motivate you if they don't know you know, no matter how trained you are, even myself, you know, I've spent years studying, you know, I've got a master's degree in everything. But unless I have a chat with you and learn about you, I'm not going to know what motivates you. I don't won't know what gets you awake in the morning, what gets you over that hill, you know. Um, all I will know is that you're feeling a bit low. So you just got to communicate and it can be hard for kids to communicate. Yeah, so that kind of leads, leads to, I guess, one of the points is like, what do we do then? So, 
when it comes to motivation, it's just having chats. Uh, now I understand that you, you guys uh, kind of offer that. Um, was it the athlete? Uh, yeah, so we're in a unique position because we can do like performance consults, right? With like, with pretty much any of our young kids here. So performance consults look a good idea. If a kid can do one, it's not a bad idea because then you can find out what motivates them, how they work. Because I, I believe that's part of it. Yeah, so it's kind of like you know backtracking a little bit what they're proud of, mm. kind of like what have they missed that they wish they had achieved and where what direction they want to head in the next three months. We're kind of doing three-month chunks because most kids can only think that far ahead realistically. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, you look at something like that. Something like that would be good because then you know what motivates motivates them you can talk with them and they've identified what motivates themselves yeah so where do you go that's a good example another example would be just chatting with the with the youth you know finding out all right what do you want to achieve why do you want to achieve it what does it mean to you to achieve it and then these are the powerful questions to ask and you know what they honestly might not know and it's just going to be trial and error but the best thing you can do is just cut out thought have those clothes ready to go have those shoes ready to go Mm. have food ready to go you know as a parent you can sometimes facilitate those things which is lovely i mean it can't always happen i mean parents have full-time lives themselves but if they can then the chances of success are higher and now when we look at that other 30 percent we talked about it starting in the mud how do you motivate them show them what's possible you know i reckon one of the greatest piece of information i found out when uh you know essentially hanging out with both you guys is finding out that you guys were a fat kid like me even sitting in the room with you guys and hearing those stories about being young, I, I can't believe it. I, I, I know you guys are being honest with me, but the idea that you guys started in a similar spot that I started, you know, and probably started the fitness cycle way sooner than I did, is, is, is a very hard one to, to kind of take in in that sense. Because I bet you any of those kids who come in for that 30% and you say to them, I know what it's like to hate coming in to the gym i know what it's like to to go for a walk and feel puffed you know i know what it's like to look in the mirror and be like look i'm i'm just fat and useless yeah you kind of like criticize yourself beat yourself down look in the mirror you know yeah just yeah the look of disappointment when you see yourself in the mirror yeah and sometimes when you eat food you don't eat because you're hungry you kind of eat to punish yourself sometimes as well Mm. but if they know that it's possible because people have walked the path before them, if they have motivation, they can see people, it's great. And also, you know, if I would say if you can get them to do quick progressions in the sense that do this exercise, something that only takes a couple of weeks to go from, you know, barely any weight to a decently impressive weight for them. One by 20 people, one by 20. Yeah, one by 20 is absolutely amazing. Uh, it, it, it gasses you, but boy, do you see results. I remember doing the one by 20 myself. Um, but that's, that's a perfect example. If they do that and then you sit at the end of that training cycle, you sit with them, look at the start numbers. And if you have some evidence to be like, hey, look, you can achieve things. You, you, you can do this. It's not impossible. They'll look at themselves and be like, damn, I'm becoming my own hero. You know, I'm becoming my own person who motivates me. And that's the big thing. It's making them believe Uh, making have faith and it can be hard you know and if you've got my training it's a lot easier don't get me wrong um you know and if you're a parent there's going to be a lot more pushback because you know kids get defensive about parents unless you've got that early fostered relationship you know it can be very hard to be like all right you know child let's do the thing because they're normally like piss off (laughs) i want to sleep or oh yeah you don't understand mum or dad you don't lift the weights Yeah, you don't know how I'm feeling or whatever the saying might be. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. So, it is about showing them that it is possible. With the professional athletes, they look at data. You know, they look at their run times once and then a month later, they'll see their new run times. They'll compare them. They'll be like, cool, I've got an X amount faster. It's working. X equals Y. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Where with the people who aren't used to tracking things like that, they don't understand how progress is meant to work. I can tell you right now, when I started training, and I believe I asked this question to you, I said, how long does it take to get like, you know, a full ripped body? And then you told me like, you know, if you want a proper ripped body, you'll probably, t- you know, without any, you know, special supplements, uh, you're looking at what, three years, I think you said? I think like two to three years, I think because of where, where you were at that time. So, it was a very individualized um, approach and plus I had to take into consideration like was your budget how much time that you have um, what was your like your starting training age what well, like what are we working with at the end of the day yeah but the thing is you, you see TV you see movies you know you see people on YouTube you know those videos you see you're like 
oh, it surely takes six months, right? Like, you know, four to six months to, to essentially have the body of Chris Hemsworth. You know, right? That's, that's, what, that's, that's what you see online. That's what you see. Quick, fast diet, exercise training, the kids who see things online and even adults. You know, you see people on Insta, YouTube, you know, all kinds of socials that are just killing it. And they'll have those like before and after shots. It'll be like two months progress, six pack. It's like, what? And that's what they believe the mark should be. They believe that if they suddenly come to the gym in a couple of months, you know, they can be in an Avengers movie. And that's, that's the illusion that, that people have. It's realistic timelines. Doing something for three years constantly is a pain in the butt. The, the other way I put it back onto people is, is more for like um, for adults than anything else. Right, it's right. like, all right, you, you've got yourself into this position over how many years? It's like, well, maybe five, six years and you want to get out of this in three months. I'm like, okay, it's going to take a little bit more time. So, you got to kind of shine the light of how, how long it's actually taken them to get here and then potentially, it's not going to take six years for them to reverse out of it no. because you're taking deliberate action. Before then, it was just kind of like, you know, they were mindless or that was like some conscious behavior that was at play. Yeah. yeah. And then if they're actually more deliberate over time, is it going to take six months? No, it'll probably take a little bit longer will take a, a lot longer than that but will it take six years no yeah but to play devil's avocado with that right yeah. you have a packet of tim tams in front of you mm. you have one tim tam suddenly the whole thing's gone you're not conscious about gaining weight you're not conscious about being lazy because you know it's it's nice it's easy time flies when you're chilling you know but you are conscious when you are running you are conscious when you're lifting but if you just push through and that's the thing if you just push through and you guys would attest to this you blink and suddenly two years has passed and you're like whoa i'm, I'm lifting over 100 kilos when, when did this happen this is my normal weight that i lift like i know for myself like i can't believe how much i'm lifting because i know where i started and i've got evidence from when i started and looking back i, I can't believe it to, to me it's still unbelievable but for me at the moment it's it's the weight that i'm lifting yeah yeah this is casual this is normal you asked old me that i'd be like no nah, that's that's impossible that's that's not real you know um that's too heavy like how am i how my bones not breaking mm. you know um uh, but it is possible and you just got to stick with it the situation is in the moment it takes conscious thought but once you get past the moment you'll achieve great things where being you know, kind of chilling, eating poorly, all this other kind of stuff. It doesn't take conscious thought. And then that time goes. It's about finding those little victories along the way. You know, you lose weight, you feel stronger. You know, you can walk more. I remember a young guy who I was training. So I do do uh, martial arts instructing. I remember a young guy I was working with. He was training and he was looking at giving up. Then he went bike riding with his friends. And he came back and he was more dedicated to training than ever because it was the first time he'd actually ever been able to challenge the other people. Like, they'd, they're mates who used to go bike riding. It's nothing competitive. But he was always the slow one behind, struggling to keep up, sweating like crazy. And suddenly, he was able to challenge them. And he was like, oh, I, I never thought I could do that. You know, a couple of the guys got puffed out before I did. That's crazy. I, that's, that's impossible. They go bike riding all the time. And that's what motivated him, because he saw it was possible for him to be the head of the pack, mm. which in his mind was impossible. And after that, he became dedicated, but eventually he did drop off when he kind of hit one of those, those barriers through growing older mm. and it became more of a social thing. Do I hang out with my friends or do I exercise? Friends won out, you know, I can't help those things. Yeah, and that's when you probably, at that point, you have to find a bigger purpose. Yeah, yeah. Um, what are the I guess what are the takeaways like what can what can youth athletes take what can like teens um, can take away from this conversation and what do parents can take away um, for athletes everyone just cut out the little things if you can have your exercise clothes already ready to go your bag packed at the front door just chuck your shoes off walk out that door once you're out of that door in those clothes you're not going to turn back and if you do ask yourself why maybe something's going on check in two tell stories like the thing i can recommend for trainers and stuff like that tell stories of when you failed tell stories of when it was hard you know when it wasn't easy where you started you know show them that you guys aren't just titans you guys started at the bottom you know now you're here it's it's a fantastic journey people love those stories because it motivates and i guess the last point would be motivation is different for everybody just because you have a friend who gets up every morning and does things they might have something that motivates them and you need to find out what works specifically for you. And the only way you can do that is by talking about things and finding it out because winning is nice, but winning might not be motivation. 
Mm. I mean, the love for winning, the admiration for winning, or proving to yourself that you can win might be the motivation. So find out what it is under that. And once you know what motivates you, tell everybody, everybody that you know is a supporter of you, because when you're feeling low, they will help motivate you back up. And they'll remind you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I fall all the time, but you know, I mean, I'm very transparent with you guys and I know you guys will kick my butt and so will my martial arts instructor and my partner and everything if, if I fall off. But also compassion. That is the biggest thing because when you fall and you lose motivation, it can feel like you're drowning. And just, just get up, buddy. Just smile. You'll be fine. Is awful. If you're just like, hey, it's okay. Look, sometimes taking a week off isn't a bad thing. All right. Let's just get you in. Let's just start with the basics. I mean, I've needed that so many times to just come to the gym, just to start off, just, just walk, do this light thing, you know, just do a couple of these things, then come back next week. If I make it through the door, I've won. So just look for that win and the rest will fall into place. Oh, that's a nice way to wrap it up. Um, if, you, if you like this episode, please like. Please subscribe as well. We are on YouTube and Spotify. Um, they're also on Facebook and Instagram. Stefan, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here on this podcast. Um, um, until next time, yeah, we'll talk about something else next time. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. You have just listened to the Inner Athlete Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with the release of weekly episodes. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to get great tips on all things youth athlete development and youth mentoring.